Fear within. One of the most deceiving kinds. So how is it that Satan has taken this concept and used it in our churches? Well, you may have heard of the secret rapture. We talked about this a couple episodes ago. Um, feel free to call the number at the end of the tape and we'll send that to you. But Left Behind, an amazing, you know, everybody's reading the Left Behind books and uh, everybody's very excited about them. But the teaching that's found in those books, you would be surprised to know, actually comes out of the beast power, out of Catholicism. What I'm about to share with you is, is a perfect example how, God, how Satan has used this beast power to take a doctrine and infiltrate our church with it. And thousands upon thousands of people believe it and never question it in the Bible. The year was 1590. The Catholic Church convened the Council of Trent. Now the reason for this Council of Trent was they were very troubled. The Protestants were full bore head. They had properly identified them as the beast power of Revelation 13, and they were beginning to lose power. So they convened and they said, we need to somehow get the focus off of us. Because all the world was beginning to see that they were the fulfillment of prophecy in Revelation 13. So they said, if we can come up with ways to somehow get them to stop looking at us as the beast and somewhere else, that would be the way to go. A Jesuit priest by the name of Francisco Ribera came up with a method of Bible interpretation called futurism. And futurism simplified is, is just that. It takes all the prophecies that had their fulfillment in history of the Catholic Church and, and the papacy and Rome and so on. takes all that stuff and it says, no, look to the future. This will all happen in the future. And so this Antichrist is not going to come until a long time in the future. And then there'll be a seven-year tribulation and so on. So he came up with this, this idea of futurism. And uh, using like 2 Thessalonians that we just read, that man of sin, that son of perdition, he said, let's cast that prophecy out into the future. Let's, let's make it mean that it hasn't happened yet. Interestingly enough, less than 300 years later, a Protestant preacher by the name of John Darby picked up on futurism, read the writings of, of the priest, and thought it was pretty neat. And he, he added his own little twist and turns to that and combined futurism with his method and they came up with dispensationalism. Now dispensationalism takes the, the periods of the Bible and breaks it into time segments. And they take different things out of their context and put them into the future. So it's still futurism in a glorified sense. Cyrus Schofield studied under John Darby. And not long after that wrote the Schofield Reference Bible, which is a very popular Bible today. The study notes in that Bible are very slanted towards futurism and dispensationalism, teaching this coming of the Lord that's secret, uh, that the prophecies that we've read about in Revelation 13 don't apply until the end of time. Uh, basically trying to steal all the truths that you and I have found by studying the Bible and the Bible alone. Not anybody's notes on that. Reminds me of Mark Twain. He says, A lie can travel halfway around the world while truth puts on its shoes. You know, it's a lot easier to read a fictional book, to sit down and be entertained, than it is to prayerfully study the Word of God. So we need to be very careful that we're not buying into the entertainment, but we need to stick with the Bible, the true Word of God. 2 Thessalonians. Let's turn there. I hope you still have your Bibles. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verses 5 through 12. We're going to continue through this thought. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to begin with verse 5. Paul is continuing to speak. And he said, oh, by the way, remember we read just a few verses earlier that there would be a falling away. Friends, what you and I have heard these last couple meetings about the beast used to be taught all over the place, now is taught rarely, if ever. So I believe that we are in a falling away right now. Verse 5, he continues, he says, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. 
And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of who? Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Friends, as I look at the Christian world today, wrapped up in all the entertainment and the movies of Left Behind and these other uh, events that are happening, the, the countless books that are written on these subjects, I can't help but wonder if this is not a fulfillment of the verses that we've just read. Let's look at another counterfeit very quickly that affects many of us here tonight. 1 John 4.2, John gives us another vital clue into the beast power. He says, Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come. And even now, already, is it in the world. This little phrase, in the flesh, is something we're going to pay very close attention to for the next couple of minutes. But before, that, before I do that, I need to describe for you another teaching that the papacy has intertwined into our churches. It's called the Immaculate Conception. This is what they say. This is from their own catechism. They say the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. So what they're saying is that Mary, the mother of God, according to them, uh, did not have a sin in her life at all. She did not have the nature that was born from Adam after sin. The fallen nature, sometimes we describe that as. Mary did not have the fallen nature. <coughs> Romans 3.10 tells us there is none righteous. No, not one. So we know biblically this is not sound doctrine. They also say, just to give you another example, the fathers of the Eastern tradition call the mother of God the all-holy and celebrate her as... as free from any stain of sin as though fashioned by the Holy Spirit and formed as a new creature. By the grace of God, Mary remained free of every personal sin her whole life long. So again, claiming that Mary did not have the same nature as you and I do. In the flesh, John says, if you do not confess that Jesus came in the flesh, you are not of God. You're the spirit of Antichrist. In the flesh biblically means in our nature. You see, if we believe that Christ was born of a sinless woman, he did not then inherit our nature, our fallen nature. We're going to, get, we're going to clarify that a little more. But agreeing in your mind that Christ lived on earth is not enough. It goes deeper than that. Hebrews 2.14 tells us, since then the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise partook of the same, exactly the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest, being Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So by saying that Jesus came in our fallen nature, I am in no way saying that Jesus sinned. Clearly, the verses in the Bible are plain as day that Jesus was without sin. But friends, if we don't understand how He lived a sin-free life, then we may be accepting what the beast is trying to teach. Have you ever, let me put it this way, have you ever talked to someone about maybe a sin in your life or a sin in their life, and you said that Jesus was our perfect example, that Jesus could overcome, that he had proved that he had lived a life free from sin, and their response is, yeah, but he was God. 
You ever hear that? 